So, as I was hinting earlier, so I've, I've been involved with the uh, the BBC more or less since it was first delivered, since I first got one, and indeed slightly before that in some respects in, in computing in general. Um, and I've not thought too much about it, apart from 10 years ago and a, and a few years ago in trying to resurrect bits and pieces and failing somewhat miserably. But then out of the blue, I received this email to my work address, which I now currently work for Qualcomm. And um, I think they would claim quite a high level of security at stopping people getting through. Um, but this didn't even arrive in my spam box, which had it have done, I may never have seen it. Um, but I was rather intrigued, uh, to say the least. Um, so uh, you mentioned Android attack, and I immediately thought this must be spam, but uh, obviously um, I replied with a question, and Dave then sent me a very, very long email <laughs> explaining a lot of things, which was, which was quite amazing. Um, and he also attached this, this picture, which I saw before I read the email, and I thought, right, who, am I, who do I recognize on here? And I thought, oh my God, it's been 30, if not 40 years ago. And I thought, I don't recognize anyone on there. What, what is this about? And so I read the email again, and um, he mentioned the T-shirt. And I had to take a double take. <laughs> I couldn't quite believe it. But um, Dave obviously liked Android, or at least he got a T-shirt made. And uh, my goodness, that, that was a great surprise, I have to say. And uh, the, uh, the email went on to say that, that, that captivated by the artwork released of Android, if, and, and the game as well, I understand. Um, a book was was made, which again absolutely amazed me. I didn't think any of this existed at all, so I was I was really overjoyed to to see all of this. Um, and and this book is there. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it, it's full of interesting artwork from many different games. And so um, I I thank David a lot for getting through to me and 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 sharing um, sharing this with me. It's been a great surprise. Um, and even more of a surprise is what what he sent me just yesterday. Um, which uh, on the back of his, uh, uh, I suppose, like the game and indeed the, the artwork, he asked me if, if we could uh, make a, a copy of Android and perhaps even a second version of it. And I, I explained to him that, well, I had some discs and I did have a second version of it, but, and I never sold it, um, but it was on my discs that I can't read. And so uh, I then, with agreement from Dave, we shipped off, some, well, 40 of my discs. I don't think he quite anticipated that, but, but uh, to, to Daniel. Now, I'm not sure if, if Daniel is on the line. I don't know, but I pity Daniel having to go through all those and, 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 and download what he can. But, but one of those discs, I hope, somewhere on it, has got uh, this second version of Android. And I, I remember very little of it, to be honest, but um, I think there were things like the ability to go from one side of the screen to the other, perhaps some different screens, different screen colors, I'm not sure, but um, I would be so um, fascinated if we were able to, to resurrect that and indeed get the source code for this and indeed all the other games because there's some, some interesting code there that I haven't seen for a very long time. And it also, um, worth pointing out, I haven't done this for a long time, so please go ask any questions, but please don't be surprised if I've forgotten it all because uh, it was such a long time ago, and I haven't had any source code to sort of flick through to remind myself of anything. So um, I, I, in some respects, feel like a beginner, and especially listening to some of your conversations. Uh, it's amazing what you guys have been able to do with, with a beep. I'm, I'm really uh, touched that this is still going. It's quite, a, quite shocking. Um, so Dave then said, right, okay, would, would I mind going and, and, and sort of putting together a few slides that sort of describe I suppose the journey um, toward you know around the BBC and, and sort of how it, how I got there. And so I have no idea what level to set this at. I haven't met any of you guys, so if you all fall asleep, please uh, please shout or prod yourself and, uh, and and get me moving. Otherwise, we may be here forever. Um, but um, anyway, let's go. So um, for me, technical things started back in the early seventies. As a as a child, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, by the way. But there is a reason I brought this Lego in here, which you'll, you'll see in a minute. But um, uh, I had a lot of technical Lego, and I guess I've always been sort of technically minded. Um, and so Lego was a great passion of mine as a young child. And I, I, I dare say, 
uh, to, to some of you guys. This was certainly before computers were available. Um, but it kind of got my mind thinking in a sort of logical way, which I think ultimately helped me. Uh, now, it's worth pointing out that my father worked for Marconi, and um, he passed away four, five years ago. And as I was going through these slides, I discovered this, this slide in the middle. Um, and I guess as an urban, let's just see if I can get a screen pointer going on here. on an old version of PowerPoint. Um, and uh, he, he did his national service in Water Beach. And, and as, as a young man, he, he worked at Marconi. And as I understood it, and this was only a, a story I got after his death, he was a project manager of a radar system um, at Marconi. And up to then, I knew he worked there, but he was more in the marketing department um, and then went on to become a, a, a director. And uh, he worked incredibly hard. And indeed, I, as, as a child, I saw very little of him. You know, he, he worked hard to earn money for us to keep us. Most of my childhood from a very early age, in fact, for most of my life, he worked very late at night um, doing his thing. And I didn't get to find out a huge amount what he did, unfortunately. Um, but this picture sort of really intrigued me because it had a couple of radars in it. And um, he probably knew later in life that I'd sort of worked on radar type things, but nothing quite like this. And so he obviously had some idea about um, technology because he started bringing home some of these things. And as a 11, 12 year old boy, um, I had no idea what they were. And I, I think the digital electronics on the left, he certainly didn't know anything about. And he knew something about the transistors and sort of explained how they worked uh, in a very rudimentary way. And I was sort of left to my own devices to sort of work it out. I didn't have a pin out or anything, but I did manage to connect a few of these together. I did have a soldering hand, so we'd solder these together and could make incredibly sensitive switches. You know, so sensitive you could touch a door handle, for example, and with six of these all connected, all balanced with resistors to get their switching point right. You can make a very, very sensitive um, detector. So that was sort of my first introduction to electronics, if you like. And uh, it kind of, again, got me interested to some extent, but I, I still didn't know anything about what these chips did. And then one day, he, this book arrived, and this got me very interested because it suddenly told me that, you know, with applying five volts and ground and a couple of inputs and outputs to these devices, you could do some simple things. Um, these are obviously simple gates and by the time you've gone through this TTL book, you realize there's a lot of things that actually you can do. And there's counters in here and adders and decoders, encoders, display drivers and what have you. And before long, I had a few of these things. And I then discovered, probably through a magazine, I'm not sure how, but I discovered Watford Electronics. And occasionally we'd go into Watford because we lived near Watford. Um, and I would spend my pocket money on these chips. And it's, it's worth noting that this, although it looks like a shop, it was just actually in a street, Cardiff Road, not far from Watford Football Ground. And this, this house here, as this was in 2008, I think they've changed the style of this now. But in 2008, you can clearly see this was where Watford Electronics was. And um, I used to go in there as a child and I would buy 74 series logic. And you can see they were 11 pence each, and I would spend my money on these integrated circuits. So we had, I don't know, NAND gates, AND gates, NOR gates, counters, mini ALUs, 4 bit ALUs, things like that. And that all really intrigued me, and I played around with that for a while. And I began to notice some of these computer ICs and thought, well, I wonder what they do. Um, but they were somewhat more expensive, so I didn't actually buy any of those. Now, it's worth pointing out that at that time, I lived in Garston, near Watford, and I lived on, on Bucknell's Lane, and this, this area here was a, as it were, my sort of social area of influence, <laughs> in the sense I would get on my bike and go and visit my friends in Bricky Wood. At the time, my primary school was here, and my, my parents pretty much gave me free reign to do whatever I liked. My father was always working, he was happy that I was happy, and so, 
this and work well. I, I knew these woods like the back of my hand and I wouldn't be scared to walk through those woods late at night. In those days, nobody batted an eyelid. And, and I had a lot of, lot of friends uh, in this area. And, um, and then come age 10, 11, 11, I'd moved, my father put me in Palmer's school, uh, as a secondary school. And a few of my friends from, from the estate also joined that school. And at that time, I guess I was a, a relative middle grader. They had a, a seeding system in the school. I was probably middle of the road, and most of my friends were middle of the road um, or thereabouts. And everything was good. And now, I don't know whether my father thought that, um, you know, perhaps the influence of some of the people nearby weren't good for me. Or what I don't know, but we moved, and we moved from from this area where I spent a lot of my childhood, all my working hours I've spent um, pretty much being sociable. Uh, I was suddenly moved four miles away, and to Kings Langley, and Kings Langley is quite near Chipperfield. And we'll come back to that connection in a minute, but I was now left somewhat isolated from my original group of friends at school and was somewhat bored. Um, so then came my 13th birthday, and I asked my father for an assessment because I thought, oh, I think it'd be good to understand what's, what's going on. And they were about 300 quid, and I, I found one in a magazine, or at least I thought I did, for about 60 quid. I had a look for it in all the archives, which is one of the things that you can do nowadays, but I couldn't find one for 60 quid, but they were 300 pounds. Now, whether my father knew uh, that that was never going to be a good investment or not, I don't know. But anyway, so if I say on my birthday, um, rather than get an oscilloscope, I got one of these things, um, which was uh, a round chip that I wanted. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do with this? Um, I had a data sheet with it. And so I know, I thought, I'll connect it to my Lego, see what we can create. And so, um, so with 7.4 series logic, you can make an oscillator by jamming the output of a, uh, an inverter gate, a Schmitt trigger inverter with a capacitor and resistor. And of course, I had no oscilloscope, so I didn't really know how fast this was going. But if you connect it up to a counter and then perhaps another counter and another counter and then an LED, you can see how fast the LED is going and work backwards, work out roughly how fast it's going. Um, and then if you have a number of these counter chips all counting away, that can be an address into the RAM. And then I picked up a keyboard from a jumble sale. So this is a, a picture I found on the internet, which is similar, uh, similar to how it looks. I think I had quite a few more ICs on here. But suffice to say, we have a mechanism to address a RAM and codes that we could save so we could program it and play back. And with my Lego, I built this little forklift truck that could go backwards and forwards and the arm could go up and down. And, um, and this was all quite exciting at the time. And I think I got to the point where I could move the forklift truck forward, pick up something, move it forward, put it down, come back, and then bring it back again, and, and, and then record it and then play it back. And um, I thought this was all, all, all very interesting, but I suppose somewhat limiting because I couldn't turn the, the Lego. It can only go forwards or backwards. Um, uh, that was that was quite interesting. But then I thought, okay, so what else can I do with this RAM? And uh, by the way, if there's anyone's got any questions, please, please feel free to chip in. Um, what else can I do with this RAM? I thought. So um, we had a black and white television, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be an idea if I could somehow get an image of that RAM on the television? And obviously, I didn't know much about televisions, but I had a book that sort of described roughly how it worked. And my father was quite insistent I wasn't going to be plugging anything into the back of this television, like a, a valve, black and white valve TV. It was very hot and um, 500 volts or whatever. So I wrapped a wire around the back of the aerial, hoping this was going to work, and, uh, and devised a circuit that took the 4,000 bits. So these were arranged as 1K by 4 bits. And I thought, well, maybe if I put a decoder on the end, I can get 4,096 by 1 bit and have, by repeating each line a few times, build up individual pixels, you know? And I thought, you know, given that I didn't have an oscilloscope and didn't, I didn't have any crystals, I thought, well, this is never gonna work very well. And I didn't really understand it, to be honest, that well either. But nevertheless, I thought, well, you know, let, let's give it a go. I think my dad thought I was bonkers. You know, nothing was ever gonna work. And well, he wasn't far off the truth. 
Um, I would sit there guessing at what this number should be and then going through the tuner, trying to tune, and occasionally something would flicker past the screen really quickly. You'd never be able to see it. And I would tweak, tweak the, the tuning up and down, backwards and forwards, and tweak this up and down, again, not really knowing, not having any of the proper sync signals, so I knew it wasn't ever going to work. But I believe, now whether this was true or not, that at some moment I saw a swirling pattern of black and white dots on the screen that clearly wasn't noise. And I ran to my father say, I've got it working. Anyway, I came back and it had gone. And I never got it back again. And, and I gave up. But for me, the analog side of this, the, the, the difficulty in, in uh, modulating this signal um, became a challenge. You know, in a way, the processing, I could understand that. It was all digital. But this had a, an additional appeal to me. And I thought, you know what? At some point, you know, this is something <clears throat> I will do. You know, um, make chips for a living. And, you know, it, it, that effectively has come to pass. You know, and so my hobby, which, you know, I did a lot at that age, I effectively still do. So you know, I'm kind of very grateful um, for that. Then, roughly at the same time, my school bought a computer. And um, so whilst at home I was playing with my electronics at school, this computer arrived. And my first thought was, great, a computer. I should be able to ask it any question and it will just tell me the answer. What an amazing machine. And so a few people were kind of interested in this. Uh, it was put in a computer room. Of course, the teachers didn't know anything about it, so we were left to sort of work out how it works. And you know, I duly got it and asked it a question and very, very quickly realized that it wasn't going to tell me any answer. It wasn't going to tell me any more than I already told it. So my initial thought was, well, what good is that? Um, but then a few of us started playing around with it, and we started doing a few things that raised a few teachers' eyebrows. And they began to think, well, what are you doing? Where did you get that from? And, I began to realize that actually we were creating things. You know, we had little 3D graphics that were rotating with some hidden line removal using, in fact, we were writing, I think, basic and some assembly code. And there were a few of us who were quite into this. And uh, it turned out that this uh, became an obsession um, to the point we would get to school early, a few of us, and during school, every break, uh, and if we could miss any lessons, then we would. This was at a time when we would. Just just before O-levels, actually. So we hadn't started our O-levels. So we had a little bit of spare time. But pretty much every moment of our day, we were glued to this thing. And then the beep came out. And we'd heard about it, uh, I think, in the end of 81. And so sometime, I'm not exactly sure, the early 82. A few of us got together, well, not got together, we independently uh, got our hands on one. Either we... In my case, I spent all of my money because there's no way my father was going to buy one for Christmas. But um, I uh, spent literally every single penny I had on one of these things. I kind of knew this, this is what we needed to do. You know, so, uh, so, yes, the rest of my teenage life was pretty much spent in this room. So remember, we'd moved house. I had no friends nearby. This, in a sense, was a substitute for my teenage years, but there we go, probably well spent, I hope. Anyway, with uh, these other two friends of mine, so uh, this is me, as I was then in 1982. Uh, so I'm Paul, and this is Oliver and Malcolm, and together we made POM software. And uh, this, we had sort of lashed together a few, few games at, at school, not particularly good ones, and now we had our own BBC Micros, we thought, right, okay, let's um, uh, let's let's see if we can sell some. You know, let, let, let's let's see what we can do and see if we can you know, perhaps make some money as a little you know, sideline. Who knows? And so we copied uh, a few a few of these games manually onto cassette and photocopied some labels. Um, and I don't even have a copy of this game. But interestingly, when I was looking through some of the um, the games on, on in the archive, 
uh, I came across a game that was almost identical to this. I couldn't believe even the playing of it. It almost felt like I was playing the same game. It was quite, quite incredible. But I, uh, I'm hoping that somewhere on one of those discs, when Daniel gets gets round to it, maybe we'll discover where this went to. But uh, it, it's it's somewhat lost at the moment. Anyway, we we made 48 copies of these games, and um, and we sold them in this shop in, in Watford called Computer Plus. And um, and I discovered this this advert for Computer Plus. The Computer Plus, I tried to find pictures of it online, couldn't find anything. And my only reference was was this in a V-Bug um, magazine. There was only one or two adverts that this company had, had bothered to place. And when I first put it in, even when I first sent this to Dave, I'd seen the computer concepts and I just assumed, oh, well, it must have been um, after we would got involved with computer concepts. But just today, as I was looking through it, I noticed um, <laughs> that's the reference uh, the, the original three of us, which I've never noticed. That was interesting. Anyway, we um, in that shop we by chance met this guy called Charles Moore, and um, in late '82. And rather than writing games for ourselves and printing them, he said, oh, "I'll tell you what, I'll do that for you, and I'll pay you a royalty. Um, how about it?" And we thought about it, thought, well, we're at school, we don't really have much time to do any of this stuff, so why not? And uh, at that time, Charles was living in Chipperfield, which was only a mile up the road. Not that we had to see him that often, but um, it was kind of uh, coincidental that we ended up you know, living relatively near him. Um, and as you can see here, Charles did all right for himself. Um, so in 84, he moved here, and I believe he, yeah, so yeah, very nice place. And and computer concepts moved there, and they all, you know, his guys that ended up working for him worked there. But, but we worked for him sort of in a freelance style. And I guess we were the first, I like, yeah, I think the first few people to work for him. This was before 1984. This was before this. This was when it was in Chipperfield. Um, and uh, he he essentially developed um, computer concepts from those early days. Um, so a few months after our uh, Watford Observer appearance, um, the Observer magazine got involved and, and did a little piece on us, which was uh, unexpected. Yeah. So I just recorded that. And, and so, and these were some of the games that um, we put together, which I, I guess you're familiar with, certainly Android Tech you'll be familiar with. Space Hawks, uh, you may or may not be. So, this was uh, 1982 and 1983. Um, I'd like to have gone through some of the source code to, to talk a bit more about it, but I've, I've largely forgotten about it. But um, as I said earlier, um, one of the things that amazes me that some of you guys have obviously put together, I'd be intrigued to know uh, if any of you are here today, but um, uh, how you can just now click on a link and directly play these games on a PC. I, I, I find uh, astonishing. I never imagined that, that this would be possible. And when a few years ago I couldn't get onto my discs to know that these games, you know, people would already put them online it was, it was very reassuring. I thought, well, at least some of this stuff has been captured. You know. So uh, very grateful for that. Um, and then, so Dave mentioned that you know you guys have been playing this uh, every few years, and I couldn't quite believe it. And Unfortunately, just a few weeks ago, I, I missed Dave's email, unfortunately, but um, I can't believe that you were literally playing this game that I had sort of given up on years ago. So I find that quite, quite astonishing. Um, so thank you guys for your interest in all this. It's, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, so we did a few other things after so Android. That was a game, and I, I, I think I sort of thought, well, you know, what else? Is there, and I think Charles in computer concepts was keen to move out of games into more um, utilities and word processing packages and things like that. So obviously something he did, um, and so he wanted to move more into the business side of things. And so he got us to to think about other things that we could do. And Oliver, so this was a picture of him at university, I believe, and um, uh, we got together to to build Distopter, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, 
I think Oliver was certainly the wizard when it came to understanding the uh, the disc chip. He, he was it was one of his passions. Um, I tried contacting Oliver, and uh, well, as I am very poor on LinkedIn, I suspect he's the same. I, I have did contact him about ten years ago, um, and um, and we had a chat, and we didn't quite meet up. So I haven't seen him since he was at university. Uh, and Malcolm, we 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 haven't heard from at all. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, anyway, there's a, there's a number of things there, and I suppose there was some disassembly code and some memory zaps and things like that. I, to be honest, I can't really remember much about it. You guys probably will remember more about it than I do. But, um, uh, but that was something that we put together whilst at school. Um, and the thing that 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 pleased me in looking back at all of this, it never really dawned on me that um, my early childhood, if you like, was affected by the chips that I bought at Watford Electronics and it never really crossed my mind. We sold all our games through Computer Plus. I worked with Computer Concepts and I never went back to Watford Electronics, um, oddly. Uh, and so I was kind of pleased when I looked back through the archive to see that actually they were selling one of my chips. I thought that was quite I say one of my chips, the software was one of the chips that they were selling. So I, I thought that was uh, quite good. I never really thought that they would have done, but they did. Um, and as, as time went on, we got a little bit more um, ambitious. And um, so I remember that the Acorn were, were promising a, a graphics extension on them. At the time, I for some reason it was late, at least that's what I recall. And um, in the interim, Charles may have said, you know, why don't you have a go, see what you can do. So um, so I did, but I can't remember much about it. <laughs> so I, don't, um, I, I do have a leaflet. The, the, um, so this, this leaflet I had and kept, and I don't know if, if this was, um, I don't know if this has been copied before, but um, somewhere on one of those discs that I can't read must be all of the original um, source code that created all these things. So it would be quite interesting if we could get that back. I'd be interested to see that running again. But, um, and I heard some guys talking about um, circle drawing algorithms um, before. And I remember at some point playing around with some of these um, pixel drawing circle algorithms, like the PRISM algorithm I think so mentioned. Um, and, um, and I certainly played around with them. Whether they're in this, I don't know. But I, I also remember spending a long time trying to do a, a fast triangle fill routine to put in here, but it didn't quite, didn't quite make it, I don't think. Almost, almost got it, but um, it didn't quite arrive in time for this but, uh, somewhere in one of those discs will be a, a fast triangle fill routine um which is a bit fiddly but um interesting at the time uh anyway so try to um contact malcolm but um unfortunately uh he, he passed away at the end of last year um and so I hadn't seen him since university. So that, that was a bit of a shock to be honest. But um, I, uh, I remember having um, some good, good times with Malcolm. But um, curiously, he, um, in, in, in finding this picture here, um, it was attached to a link. And in the link was his memorial service. And it turned out that and I didn't know any of this. In fact, and I found out more about Malcolm through his memorial service than that I ever knew because um, he, uh, uh, it turned out, you know, he, he had a broken home and moved around in various places. And then obviously what I didn't know during his, um, his recent life is that uh, he, he had uh, done a lot of the work um, with children's charities around the world and he traveled a lot and, uh, and, and, and joined the church and became a musician and done and, and done a lot of lot of things, and um, and in his memorial service, um, Pond Software got a, a brief mention. So um, that was quite quite touching. Um, but uh, anyway, sad, sadly, Malcolm is, is 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 not with us anymore, which is uh, a great shame. But he 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 helped me write um, 
print master. And again, I, I remember very little of it, to be honest. But um, and he wrote some of the uh, one or two of the games in, in games galore as well. Which um, so somehow I'd like to uh, well thank Malcolm or at least uh, um, I think I said a few words. But, um, anyway, that's so. Moving on, one of the other things that I hadn't realized looking back at the archive um, is, is how much computer concepts advertised. I, I was astonished. Every other page seemed to have computer concepts on it. And at the time, I never had much time to read these magazines. And, and so um, this was all relatively new to me, to be honest. I mean, you know, we worked for, for Charles and he did all this stuff. and um, he um, uh, and and you know you give us royalty checks and that was it. But um, in in the middle of all of this was was all this this advertising and it all was a little bit lost to me. Um, and I, I do remember this occasion, somewhat funny in a way. Um, there was a BBC Micro show that, that that we went to, and again looking through the archive, I was quite intrigued to see that. Um, uh, the, the advert for computer concepts at the time was centered around the graphics ROM, obviously, that had just come online. And, and I know, happened to notice that the next page was talking about Herman Hauser. Not that I've got any connection to him, but I thought it was quite interesting. But uh, he was very much on the scene, obviously, at, at the show and having something to say. But uh, my, my overwhelming memory of this show was the fact that um, I was there demonstrating the graphics ROM and people come up to me and I'd and, um, be taking payments. Uh, I mean, nobody had showed me how to use the, um, the swipe machine that you use for credit cards in those days. And so um, somehow I managed to get it wrong. And every single one that I sold effectively, I was giving it away and I had no idea. Um, and the other thing I've discovered was a thing called Pigman, which um, I don't know if anyone knows, but somebody had managed to install it on one of the computers such that when you turned it on, Pigman came up, which was somewhat... Uh, Hilarious and embarrassing. This was 1988, and um, so during this period, um, I, I worked with another guy, and I'm not even sure if I ever met this other guy. Um, but I, I discovered a letter that, that from Computer Concepts because, of course, at that time I had no phone at university. There was no internet. The only way of contacting people was by letter, which nowadays seems like, like madness. But there were a number of letters that went backwards and forwards. And, and normally letters aren't there to sort of congratulate you on being good. Um, but most of those letters were because they found a bug in Interbase. And, and this was a really big problem that I needed to sort out. And um, so I think I must have sorted it out because I eventually got a letter saying, can I send the final piece of the code? And I've been trying to find who the other person was that worked on this. And in all the other letters, it had talked about Gavin, but it had never given him, given me a surname. So I had no idea who it was. But um, on, in this particular letter, it mentioned Gavin Theobald. And I thought, oh, okay, right. So I now, now have a name. So I looked him up. And indeed, he mentioned computer concept. His name came up twice with computer concept. So once in a, um, a bibliography about maths, and this guy had sort of gone on to, to, to do a lot about um, maths in terms of uh, uh, yeah, regular polyhedra. And if you're interested, go and have a look. But he's written whole books and papers on the ways of dissecting different shapes and converting them from one to another. And obviously, that was his specialist subject. But the other interesting link that came up um, associated him with Jeremy Rushton. Um, which is a name I'm sure most people recognize. And there's another name, Philip Martin, that I don't recognize. Um, but um, anyway, I'm, I'm not even sure if I ever met the guy. It was an interesting arrangement. I was at university. I sent him the, the sort of engine for the interbase, uh, so which, which was essentially all the database functionality. And I believe he wrote all the language that sat on top of it. And um, probably wrote the language that connected into base to into calc and into word and all the rest of it that ultimately went on um but uh, i i this was the last thing i did after this i i kind of pulled out the, um, uh, 
BBC programming and working with computer concepts. This was the last thing I did. Uh, what were the roles of uh, the Palm Group uh, when they started? What portions of uh, the programs did each each take responsibility for? Um, that's a good question. So I, I um, so certainly with this doctor, um, Oliver had a passion for um, the, you know interfacing to the chips. Um, I think he described it as bashing the disk controller was a term he used, which meant nothing to me, but um, um, I guess it meant programming it in some way. <laughs> or maybe it meant bashing the heads of the disk against the, the disk. I don't know. But um, yeah, so, so in that case, he, he would be doing all the low level stuff. And I think I did the, uh, the sort of high level, uh, the, the memory zap routine, the disk assembler, the decoding of the command parts of it. So I remember doing those bits. Um, with the print master, I'm a little bit more sketchy. Um, but I guess we might have had a similar split. Maybe Malcolm did the, uh, the low level interfacing and maybe I did the higher level stuff. Thank you for that game though, a wonderful game. And of course this doctor, another wonderful product. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you used it. I'm glad I'm speaking to people who sort of appreciate it. Obviously most of my life I, I work with people younger than me who've never even heard of the beep. So, um, you know, it's not a conversation I have very often, but uh, occasionally I do come across people of my age and we talk about these things. And it's, it's they occasionally, you know, they, if they've used a the bee, they've probably heard about this doctor, even if they haven't uh, used it. But um, it seems to be fairly prolific, I guess. To be honest, I never really used it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's when you're developing stuff, um, I don't know, you're sort of focused on doing that rather than I don't play many games particularly. I had loads of games. A lot of the discs there were, were full of games, but I don't really remember playing them. Um, yeah. Although so Chucky, imagine how I, played, I played Chucky Egg a lot and uh, Planetoid. There you go. I really enjoyed those two games in particular. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in Canada, so you can imagine how many beebs I get to see here. Yeah, I, I bet. Yeah, not many. <laughs> <laughs> Not many. Well, it's good, good, good that you're joining this. It's amazing. Love it uh, worldwide. I, um, I'm even more astonished. Um, yeah, my jaw hasn't stopped hitting the ground. That, uh, <laughs> you guys are still playing with this stuff. It's amazing. Hi, Paul. I'm um, one of those guys who makes BBC games now. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, oh, actually, amazing. there's a. One of the the guys tra talking later, he's very much into bashing the disc controller as well. So. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, yeah, I have kind of a, a mirror and a similarity to you. I work for, for Imagination, so we're kind of on the GPU side. Kind yeah, of bashing okay. Yeah. Um, but I <laughs> live in Chipfield and work in Kings Langley. No way. <laughs> yes, but I write my BBC games in Chipfield. <laughs> that is incredible. I don't believe it. Right. So imagine, because that's, yes, because that, that I, yes, so now you, now you mention it. Yeah, that is one of the, uh, the companies on the, there's a little science park, isn't it? Near the station. Is that right? Yeah. If I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I remember seeing a number of job adverts over the years thinking, <laughs> oh, King's Angle, I could go and live there. Well, there you go. That's a small world, isn't it? Mm. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, my mother still lives there, obviously. So uh, I haven't seen her for a while, but, um, yeah, so you live in Chipperfield. Whereabouts in Chipperfield? Um, I, I don't know what landmarks would still have been there when you were there, but if you come up from Kings Langley, uh, it's the first proper road on the right. There's like a crossroads before you get to the actual crossroads. There was a garden centre. Yeah. We live yeah. opposite the back entrance to the garden centre, which they're about to knock down and build houses. Oh, what a surprise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what a surprise. <laughs> Um, oh well, that is an incredibly yeah, small world. Well, so what? And uh, have you been involved in in the BBC since it was first conceived? How? Yeah, I did some. I didn't get anything published back in the day. A friend and I, a friend Gil, who wrote Repton One and Two for the Spectrum, ported those. Okay. Uh, we got a game signed with Tynesoft, but we never. He moved to university at one end of the country, and I was at the other, yeah. and. Yeah. Obviously, cooperative programming without the internet is not as 
I was productive. So. No, yes, I know that. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, oh, very good to to meet you. That's very interesting. And yeah, thanks for the talk. <laughs> well, yes, I don't. <laughs> wasn't really sure what what level to aim it at, but um, hopefully it's okay. It's great. Could have done with more assembler, maybe. <laughs> well, if I had my discs, I would um, <laughs> love to have gone through it. Maybe there's there's an opportunity for for another one, maybe when I get some of my code back. Yeah, it's a bit hard talking about that kind of stuff when I have no memory <laughs> and, <laughs> and no, very little information apart from what I can get, you know, from, from magazine <laughs> adverts and things. But uh, yeah, there's an incredible amount of information out there. I had no idea. I really didn't. Um, well, I'm glad you found us, or Dave found you, one way or the other. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's good to talk to you guys. I'll let somebody else have a go now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you were talking about uh, Computer Plus in Watford. Yes. Yes, I remember them. Uh, bought a few things from them back when they were there. Uh, right. okay. But I, no, you're not going to find many pictures because that, that area got all redeveloped a few years back. Yes. Uh, when they redid the shopping centre. That's right. Yes, I, I looked at it online and uh, there was very little there. And it did say the only the only reference I got to where the shop was was opposite um, uh, was it Truins. That's right, opposite Truins. They said, which was you say knocked down and rebuilt. So um, yes, I'm sure it's not there anymore. But, uh, but I didn't even manage to find a picture of the shop or anything in the shop. No. Very, very few references to, to the place. Yeah, it took me a long time to find it. And even remember the name of it. <laughs> I couldn't remember the name. But, uh, yeah, there was, yeah, there was them, there was Watford Electronics, and there was another one right up the top end of the uh, Watford High Street by the City mm -hmm. Hall. Um, and that was still there because it was a camera shop as well, and they're still going. Right. Okay. Right. So I don't know if well, you ever went to that one. Uh, I probably did, but I don't remember, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. So have you had much involvement with, with BBC since its early days? Uh, I got one, oh, probably, what, 82, 83, somewhere around there. Used it for a good few years. They sort of moved on to the Atari ST, then PCs. But... Um, got back into them in recent years yeah yeah stupidly sold my original one <laughs> well, i've still got mine not that it well i don't know if it works but the disk drive doesn't work that's for sure so um yeah i wasn't able to load anything but there we go hopefully they'll be resurrected at some point hi paul can you hear me yes i can hello who, who am i talking? Uh, yeah i was uh I was a guy going on about Doros circles and Bresnan line drawing. Ah, before. right. <clears throat> I had the uh, computer concepts uh, graphics uh, toolbox. Um, but I was saying to Dave um, the other day when he said you were coming on to speak uh, about this doctor. I mean that that was invaluable. I had that on every single one of my work machines. Made great use of the disassembler, um, and then I moved to London in '86 and uh, started working on PCs. And I tried to write a version of MZAP and DZAP for that. So yeah, they, they were great things. And uh, uh, sorry to hear about your friend uh, saying as well, that it's, that's the reason preserving all this stuff is so important, you know, because unfortunately yeah. Um, yeah. people working on, it was cutting edge stuff at the time, wasn't it? And um, it, it was, and, and I think because I think a lot of it was done individually in a way that makes it more valuable. We nowadays, you know, you have a game and a hundred people work on it or whatever, and it's all very anonymous. And even all the stuff I do, I work, you know, with Bluetooth, but, um, you know, there's no one thing that any one person does that, that's, uh, that, that makes a huge difference. You're all part of a massive um, collection of people from all over the world. In fact, <laughs> um, you know, it's a real, uh, a real collaborative effort nowadays these these big developments and so i think yeah the idea and the concept of individuals being innovative is, is quite hard to to capture yeah it's, it's i forget the name of the guys uh, who give a, a talk at the center for computing history but he, he 
he designed the BBC Micro motherboard and he was saying it was like one of the last machines where one person could hold all of all the variables of, of the of the uh, board in in their own head um just without wanting to teach grandma how to suck eggs kind of thing are you anywhere near um cambridge by any chance because well, i live in cambridge oh right oh cool because uh, those discs if you if you've um you know if they're starting to get bit rot or the magnetic oxides do and if you I, I'd take them to somewhere that's got a cryoflux system. Anyway, uh, look, brilliant talk, uh, Paul, uh, Paul. Thanks for that. Oh, well, th thank you for listening. Thank you.